scripture with you. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about. Did you want to say something? Okay. Um, about the gospel, you know, that we preach, that we teach. And, you know, about the person of God. You know, as I've, as I've walked with God through the years, you know, come to realize that, you know, we can't figure everything out. We don't, we don't have the answer to everything. I don't care how long you've been walking with God. I don't care how much you study the Word of God, how many teachers you sit under. You know, I don't care how much you pray. There is a mystery. There's an element of mystery to the gospel. There's an element of mystery to the person of God. You know, the Bible said it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Then they say that over there in the book of Proverbs. But it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. You know, it's what it's what we what we place value on in our lives. What do you value? You know, to not value something in the, in, the, in the biblical sense means to treat it lightly, to treat it of little worth. We get our word despised. How many of you ever, I mean, I go to Pensacola every once in a while to visit my daughter and grandkids and stuff, and, uh, well, I have two daughters down there now, but... You know, under every bridge, just about, there are people that are less fortunate, that are living in tents, that are washing windows, that are bumming. You know what I'm saying? And when you when you see that type of person, maybe a street person, or, what do you think about that person? Do you, do you think less of that person? Because I'm going to tell you, that's the natural inclination of the human heart, apart from God, is to think less of that person. Because of their condition, because of their situation, maybe because of their choices, maybe things out of their control, that they're in a bad spot. And if we're not careful, we, we place an estimation on that. We place a value on like that person is less valuable because their circumstances are not as good as yours. I mean, I know, I know the human heart when you see somebody like that, you know? And, and, and when it comes to the things of God, you know, unless we recognize them, unless we were trained and we learn to hear from God and learn to estimate things according to the way He values them, you know, we won't treat them like they're important, like they're treasures. You know, the mystery, you know, Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel. You know, great is the mystery. A mystery is, what, what do, do, do any of you like mysteries on TV? Ellen does. <laughs> you know, I, I like mysteries. I, I like something that I, I, I have to watch and, and I have to figure it out. You know, but a lot of times it takes me totally by surprise. Now, some of them are pretty obvious which way they're going. But I had, I, I had one movie, I'm not going to mention the name of it, that I watched. And I was totally shocked at the, at the end of the movie how it unfolded. You know, and that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to search out the mystery. I mean, it's a mystery revealed. It is. You know, in the Old Testament, it was a mystery concealed. We, we didn't see clearly. It was like a dimly lit room. And even the people that were prophesying didn't have an understanding of what they were saying. They only knew by the Spirit that it was not for them, it was for us. But we have to care. We have to place importance on seeking out and searching out the mystery. You know, even the, the apostles and those that, that were there when Jesus was crucified, they did not 
understand what was taking place. To them, it was a tragedy. To them, it was defeat. And even after he rose from the dead, they still didn't understand the scriptures. And even after the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Spirit, and like Sister Francis was teaching on Wednesday night, even in Acts 10, they still didn't understand what God had done at the cross and at the resurrection from the dead and the exaltation. They still didn't understand it. And it had been 10 years that they had been preaching and teaching and walking in the things of God, but yet they still didn't understand the mystery. And then God saved a man named Saul. And he became Paul. And God took him on the backside of the desert and taught him the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was totally contrary to everything that he had been taught. Paul had to unlearn. He had to unlearn. How many of you have had to unlearn some things? <laughs> Boy, I have been taught wrong. And it is nobody's fault, per se, because they didn't know any more than I didn't know. And I went to Bible school, and one of the most prominent Bible teachers at the time, and he was wrong about some things. But he was right about some things. So we've got to be open to be taught. To, to hear the voice of God, be open to the things of God. You know, I, 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 I think about things <clears throat> of conscience. You know, we have to be careful with people, in dealing with people. And, 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 you know, we have to be careful that we don't impose on people the things that maybe God has revealed to you but you're not, they're not ready to walk in that yet. I'm just going to use Sister Frances as an example because I know she is strong. And she wouldn't take anything I say, you know, as a derogatory statement because Sister Frances will tell you herself. <clears throat> when she first came to Natchitoches, and I think I've said this before, she couldn't wear pants. Because she had been taught her whole life that women were not supposed to wear men's clothing. And do you know that if she would have, it would have affected her conscience. Now your conscience, a lot of people don't understand what conscience means. Conscience is how you see yourself. In your relationship to God concerning divine things. Now there are some people, I know a young lady, and she's absolutely beautiful. And she has the prettiest hair that I think I've ever seen. And, uh, and, and, and in her church, where she goes to church, they're taught that it's wrong to cut your hair. Now, she can go have her hair trimmed. Now, what's the difference between trimming and cutting? I don't really know. But if you cut them dead ends off, now see, but I'm not, I'm not picking. But what I'm saying is, when it comes to scruples of conscience, you know, we have to be very careful not to wound people's conscience. Paul said, I can't tell you certain things because you're not able to bear it. There are certain things that I don't tell people. I don't try to talk people out of their convictions or what they've been taught that's right or wrong. The only thing I can do is teach the truth and let God deal with their consciences. Because many times people actually need, the Bible says that their faith is weak. They're not totally dependent upon 
their faith in him. But God does not despise that person. You know, it says, let not let, let him that doesn't eat certain things. Let, don't let him judge the person that does. And don't let the person that's strong in faith <laughs> despise. See what I'm talking about? Despise. Think less of, less valuable if the person's weak in faith. They may need a little help in their faith. You know what I'm saying? There were certain people that came out. If you read the book of Romans in the 14th and 15th chapter, I don't know why I'm saying all this, but I felt prompted to say it. In the 14th, 15th chapter of the book of Romans, Paul realized that there were certain people coming out of Judaism that were being saved, and they were taught that it was ceremonially unclean to eat certain things. But Paul also knew that it takes time to retrain somebody's conscience to where they understand that their relationship to God is not based on certain ceremonial things that are clean or unclean, long sleeves, women's dresses, what you eat, what you don't eat. You know, we don't place emphasis on that in our teaching. But there are certain people that whose consciences have to be retrained. I remember that Sister Francis went from wearing... Do you remember this, Ellen? You remember what I'm talking about? She went from wearing... Uh, dresses to kulaks. How many of you know what kulaks is? I thought they were cool looking myself, but that, that's been a long time ago. Long, long time ago. And then to dresses, and then to dress women's dress slacks. I mean, I wouldn't look too good in a pair of women's dress slacks. You know what I'm saying? That'd be women's wear to me. I, I wouldn't wear that. You know what I'm saying? So we, we, we need to be careful in our dealing with people. Because God is concerned about the person. Yes, that's right. You know, God's concerned. We need, to, we need to guard one another's faith. When Paul talks about offending people, he's not talking about making people mad, though that could be part of it. But when Paul talks about offending someone, he's talking about injuring their faith. Don't injure their faith. You know, we should do nothing, nothing that would uh, cause somebody's faith to be weakened, for them to be discouraged and disappointed. Paul said, who is offended and I don't burn? In other words, it affects me. It, it, it affects me greatly when somebody's offended, when somebody is hurt, their faith is hurt. We don't need to hurt anybody's faith. So we need to be careful. In, in, in our life, guarding our lives and, and placing people that are valuable. I remember when I was, this has been years, decades ago. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say things like, well, you know, uh, they're just going to have to get over it. Because, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this or do that. And, it, and, it, and it, it, if they're offended, you know, and it was very uncharitable attitude toward people. You know, if I know that somebody is offended by something, then I'm not going to do that. Not while I'm around them. Now, if, they, if they're offended at me eating a ribeye steak, then I'm going to wait till they're not around and eat my ribeye steak. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, it, it says that we're not supposed to be, uh, uh, why should I let my faith be judged by somebody else's conscience? But, see, when you're, when you're not living for yourself, when you're living for others, we should no longer live unto ourselves, the Bible says. So we're supposed to walk charitably, we're supposed to walk in love, putting the other person first. That's what the Bible teaches. You know. So I don't know why I said all that, but you know, it's very important. Uh, I was I was speaking to someone the other day, and uh, you know, I can always locate people by what they say. That's why it's very important to listen to people. To take the time to not always be doing all the talking. You know, the Bible says be swift to hear and slow to speak. And weigh what's being said by that person. Now, I wasn't judging this person. I wasn't criticizing this person. But I was just listening to what they were saying so that I could see where they were at in spiritually, uh, spiritual condition. Where they were at as far as like 
maturity in Christ and how much they knew and how long they've been walking with the Lord. And, you know, being very careful what I said. You know, sometimes you have to feed people with an eyedropper instead of with a bottle. Some, sometimes they can't bear very much, especially when we're dealing with people that are very, very young in the Lord. Very babes in Christ. That we have to feed them with milk. Things that are already digested. Things that maybe you've experienced and you went through. And then you can relay your experience along with the truth of God's word. As long as you convey it in love. And gentleness. And not be judgmental or critical. You know of that person who may be having struggles in their life. But you know, babies have struggles. Did you know that? Babies have trouble crawling to begin with, even rolling over. And then they have trouble uh, walking. They start pulling themselves up on furniture and then fall down, hit their head. And, you know, we take care of people that are, are weak, that are, are, are immature, you know, that haven't grown up in the Lord. You know, so we have to be very careful in our attitude. The Lord is very, very... Uh, He's very, very concerned about the way we treat one another in the body, in the body of Christ. You know, and not to be critical of a person that if they've started walking with God and they make some mistakes, that we don't, that we're not critical of them because we're not the judge. He, there's one lawgiver and judge. That's what the scripture said in the previous chapter, isn't it? Who's able to save and destroy. You know, and, and the scripture, even when it's talking about people that are weak, that we consider weak, that, uh, you know, the Bible says they shall be holding up. God's going to hold those people up. He's going to strengthen them. You know, the, the Bible says there's not many wise, not many noble, you know, not many strong. You know, what, we, what the world would consider, you know, man, man, there's something else, man. Oh, they're a champion boxer or they're a movie star or they're a philosopher or whatever they are. God doesn't place it. He said God has chosen the weak things. In the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise, the things that are not. And that has reference to the slaves in the Roman Empire who had no standing, no citizenship whatsoever at all. And God said, I've chosen them. Why? So that no one can glory in his presence. No one can tell. How many of you, I, you know, when I, heard, when I heard that teaching about the, the weak things and the foolish things and the things that are not, and I thought about me meeting that category. I'm the one. I, I, I'm not wise. I'm not strong. You know, I'm not famous. I'm not noble. You know, I, I, I meet the criteria. So God has chosen me. You know, so it's very important that we don't be critical, that we embrace people that we and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the chapter. I don't know exactly where uh, Brother Mark ended. I think he said verse 13. Was it verse 13, brother? Or was it a little bit further up? I, I studied the whole chapter. So verse 11. OK. Okay, let's start with uh, verse 10. It says, Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. How many of you ever suffered? Nobody? Everybody? <laughs> you know, the, um, the idea that you're not going to suffer pain or disappointment or persecution. I mean, that's an unreal expectation. If you think you're just going to walk with God and everything's going to be rosy and everything's going to go great, you know, that you're not going to suffer any opposition or setbacks, you know, that you're, you're living in a fantasy. Yep. Right. You're living in a fantasy. You know, I remember the first time I, I, I tried to start a business. <clears throat> Man, I was so shocked and disappointed that people were so dirty and underhanded 
and low down and dishonest. I was so shocked that, that hardly anybody had my best interest at heart. I, I was totally, I mean, I, I went into that with such unreal expectations. That it was a fantasy and I, I, it eventually folded. I, thank God I didn't go into debt. Thank God I just, I just let the person that I got the business from have it back. But it was a very, very painful, painful experience to go into business like that and to expect everybody to be like you are. But they're not. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure everybody or anybody that's in business. You know, you, or even people that are employed are, are totally, you know, disappointed. You know, if you have unreal expectations. But when you understand that, you know, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a, an understanding that there's both pain and pleasure. You know, there's success. And then, you know, there's disappointment in, in the Christian life. You know, you, 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 you take God's word and God's principles and you have an experience with God. You experience the goodness of God and the love of God and then you go out into the world. And Jesus said, you know, you're going to suffer persecution. You're, you're going to have setbacks. You know, you're, you're going to have disappointments. You're going to have tribulation. You know, and he's talking about the prophets here. I mean, back in these days, guys, they didn't just kill the, the message. They killed the messenger. You know, and a lot of times, you know, you yeah, that's right. They killed the messenger too, buddy. How many of you ever heard that term? Don't, don't kill the messenger. If you don't like the message, don't kill the messenger. You know, but, you know, whenever you, whenever you come into this walk, and you expect it not to be any opposition. And, and then when it happens, you know, people are just shocked. You know, you, you obey God. You, you do what God said to do. And then, you know, everything doesn't work out like peaches and cream. It's so true. Kind of like marriage. You know, you enter into marriage with a fantasy idea. But most marriages don't end in fantasy. It's reality that you're dealing with another person and their will and their desires and their personality and their likes and their dislikes. I think you need to take a real look. You know, if you plan on spending the rest of your life with somebody, you know, they, they, oh, uh, there's one church that I really, I, I love this church. It's uh, out in California. <coughs> Excuse me. But they have a they have a, a, a test that you take before they let you get before they will marry you, they give you a test. Personality capab uh, compatibilities, you know, the 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 uh, the economic uh, area you came from compared to your wife and your husband. You know, and, and, and people enter in that's why people enter into marriage. In, in, with romance in mind and with love and all these, these high ideas and then they face the wind. You know, I think about Jesus. I, I think about him and, and I know he hears from the Father because he says, I only do the things I, I, I see my Father do. I only hear, I only say the things I hear my Father say and Jesus walks up to the edge of the lake and he said, let us pass over to the other side. Now, man, if Jesus said we're going over to the other side, surely it's going to be smooth sailing, man. The sun's going to be shining. The dolphins are going to be jumping out in front of our boat, man. And it's just going to be wonderful. And what happens? There's a storm of wind. It's, it's a supernatural storm. It's not just a natural storm. It's supernatural. It comes from the enemy. And he tries to stop the plan of God. He tries to stop Jesus from getting to the other side because that guy over there on the other side has a legion of demons inside of him. And the enemy knows that if Jesus goes over there, it's not going to be good. There's going to be two kingdoms that clash. 
and he knows he's going to lose. It's the same way with you and I, you know. When, we, when we're obeying God, when we're walking with God, you can expect opposition. You can expect things to come against you to try to stop the purposes and plans of God in your life. And to me, I mean, it's a, a, a total mystery when you're going through it. You know, it's very trying. That's why they call it a trial. It's very trying on your, on, your, on your emotions, you know, and your understanding, trying to figure it out with your head. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure Job, it talks about Job here. Let's read on down a little bit. It says, uh, be patient. No, that's, 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 that's the verse before. Behold, we count them happy, which what? Endure. I, I asked somebody the other day, because I'm going through something in my life right now. And it's not easy. I mean, it's hard. And you know, the Bible said, he that will love life and see good days. And I asked this person, who's a very good friend of mine. I said, sometimes I wonder if there's going to be good days. Yep. Love life. And say, How many have ever loved life? How many have ever had that gusto moment? Uh -oh. How many have ever had that gusto moment in your life? Man. Everything's going great. I'll never forget. I had everything I owned paid for. Everything. I had a nice home. I had a business. I mean, it, it, everything was great. I was laying there on the couch watching the Discovery Channel. One of my favorite uh, episodes was on. And I was laying on that nice, comfortable couch. And my kids were there, you know. I had all my kids with me. And, I mean, it was just great. And I looked up, and I looked up at my wife, then my wife. And I said, man, isn't this great? Everything we have is paid for. We're debt free. We've got a business. We've got money in the bank. I, I'm just so happy. And when someone looks at you and says, I'm glad you are. And you know what I thought? Oh, brother. Here we go. Here we go. The enemy is going to come and try to mess up your plans. Don't think, you know, Brother Swagger says you're either coming out of a trial or going into one. Somebody told me the other day, I had never really thought about it before in my life. They said, you know, you married a woman that had a special child. Her name was Megan. And she had Down syndrome. She wasn't expected to live. She wasn't supposed to walk. She wasn't supposed to talk. And I never forget when they brought her home from the hospital, they, they sent her home to die. And I, I was on my face in the church at Faith Living Work Fellowship, and I was holding her tiny little feet. And the presence of God came on me, and I interceded and groaned and travailed for that child. And I, when I left church that day, I said, God joined my spirit to that child today. Well, I ended up raising that baby. Ended up raising her. And I spent 12 and a half years with her. And uh, then she died in 2003 on November the 10th. And uh, then I had to take care of a friend of mine who was old and, and he got to where he couldn't take care of himself. And, and I had to take care of him. And then now I'm having to take care of my mom. And uh, I, they, the person reminded me about that. I said, Dad, don't you realize you've taken care of Megan and you've taken care of uh, Jimmy Smith and, 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 and now you're taking care of your mom. And you know, I got to thinking about it. I was like, you know, I really haven't really thought about that before. I've spent about uh, half of my life taking care of people. You know, special needs people. But I never considered it a trial, especially raising my girl and taking care of my friend, until I had to start taking care of my mom. 
You know, it's one thing to take care of somebody and deal with somebody that is that is all there mentally. Or Megan was there. She was smart enough. She knew what she was doing. She was sharp. I mean, she may have been handicapped in some senses, but she she was she was a pleasure for me to be around. But when a, when a, when you when you face unpleasant circumstances, and God has placed you in unpleasant places. Where you're having to deal with things that are unpleasant and they don't cater to your emotions and to your pleasure points. You know, it can be a challenge. And then you ask yourself, will there be good days? Love life and see good days. What are you going to do? You're going to endure. You're going to endure. You're going to remain the same. You know, you're not going to throw in the towel. You're not going to quit doing what's right. I had a guy come up to me one time on my front porch, and I was sitting out there. It was in front of the locker plant out there when I used to own a home right on the highway. And I was sitting out on the front porch, and he had, he had uh, been so mean to his wife that she left him. And he came up on that porch and was wanting to justify himself and wanting to prove himself right. And he was ang I could tell he was angry. And I told that person, I said, I don't care what that person has done. And I knew most of it was his fault, but I never said that. But I told him, I said, no matter what takes place, you do what's right. You walk in love. What they're doing has nothing to do with you. Because what's most important is this. Amen. 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 You keep this right, it's going to make this right. Now, I'm not saying that person is going to come back into your life. You, you have no, no control over that. They have a will of their own. But the main thing is keeping it right here. Enduring. Remaining the same in every circumstance. Being patient. Believing in the goodness of God. The wisdom of God. The power of God. The devil wants to steal our joy. And because, you know, that's where, that's one of our foundations in Christ. Is to be able to live in peace no matter what's going on around us. And if he can, then we'll end up being a tool for him to steal others' joy because we're not handling right what what ministry opportunities are given to us from the Lord. So if we look at it in that aspect as you know ministry opportunities for God to bless, because most of the time that we we don't, it's because we're seeing how how it makes us feel as opposed to well, what's God want me to do about this? And you know, it's not we don't take things personally, but see it as it is. It's, you know, monkey wrenches that the devil's put there to steal our joy and to take our peace and, and to use us as a tool to do that to somebody else. Yeah, yeah that's true. We, we don't need to let the devil steal our joy or our peace in any circumstance. Because that, that's his aim, is to steal your faith. And if he steals your faith, he's got your joy and he's got your peace. If he can break that, you know. I, I, I know what it's like to, to suffer loss. You know, loss, especially in relationships, if you, if, you, if you have a broken relationship, there's a great sense of loss that comes with it. You know, especially if you come out of a, a good relationship, for the most part. You suffer loss. But you know, the Bible says that we are to take joyfully the spoiling of our goods. Why? Because we have a more enduring substance. That faith is not a way. See, that, that's, that you have to keep your perspective right if you're going through trouble and suffering. There will be good days. That's right. There will be good days. The sun will shine again. I mean, and you may go through a time in your life like Job to where it's so horrendous and so, so much suffering 
that the Lord will say, that's it. No more for you. You, pr you know, you've been proven. Because a lot of times when we go through things in our life, it's so that we'll know where we're at. Where am I at? What is it? I'm located now. The testing and the trying is so that you can see where you are. So that you can see that you need to grow. That he's, what he's working in you is much more important than what he might deliver you from or bring you through. Because Job said, when he brings me forth, I shall be as silver and I shall be as gold. Because he's working in you. He's making you like his son. Conforming you to his image. You know, we count them happy that endure. Once you pass through a trial, the lesson is learned. And there's a reward that comes through enduring. There's a place of, of happiness. And there's a place that, that overcoming. I know. You know, I've walked through some overcoming situations in my life. You know? And then you can minister to others. Let's read on that. It says, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that he is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That's what was revealed in the book of Job. You know, how, how merciful and how good the Lord is. That's what's revealed in the book of Job. That's the main thing. It's the goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. You know, a lot of people try to figure out, well, you know, I used to hear this in the Word of Faith camp all the time. Well, if Job would have done this, and if Job wouldn't have done that, and if he wouldn't have said this and wouldn't have said that, then he wouldn't have had to go through that suffering. That's not true. You keep all your words just right. You, you know, the Lord said he's perfect and right, didn't he? I mean, we know he was justified by faith, and that's why the Lord can say he's perfect and upright. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the devil that asked Job, asked God about Job. It was God that pointed Job out to the devil. Isn't that? Yeah. That's right. Sure enough. And, and Job got a revelation of the tender mercies and love of God through the whole situation. Even though he suffered loss. But, he, but God brought him through. God delivered him. Through that, through that terrible situation. And not only did he deliver him, he restored him. And not only did he restore him, he gave him more than what he had before. But, but Job did suffer loss. And Job was a human being just like you and I. If you read the book of Job, you'll see. He got pretty down. I'm telling you, if you go from up here, you know, my daddy always used to tell me, it's easy to go up, son, hard to come down. That's true. So you know, you, you know, there were questions and, 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 and he was examining himself and, you know, everything that he went through. But God was revealing who he was. You know, I've had God deliver me before through a, through a terrible, terrible trial. It lasted for years. You know, I, I kept going to church. I kept praying. I kept reading my Bible. You know, I kept living life, but all the time, people never knew what was going on on the inside of me. They never knew the struggles that I had at night. Sister Carolyn knows what I'm talking about. When you face the enemy of your soul in accusation after accusation after accusation. Oh, Brother Roger, if you'd have just known this, you, I understand that, but I didn't know that. And nobody else knew that either of what I was going through. But it took God to divinely deliver me. And after I got through with it, I was like, Phew. now I don't have to face that anymore. You know? 
I'm telling you, God can reveal himself, and I found out how, love, how loving and merciful and kind the Lord was and is. He was revealing himself to me. But I had to walk through some tough times. Tough times. This next verse, I haven't got for a couple of minutes. I'm not going to get into this, y'all. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> Above all swearing. I'm going to stop right there, guys. I ain't got but about two minutes left. I appreciate your attention. I hope, hope God ministered to you this morning. Good morning.
to be an American? How many of you are thankful to be in the United? Go ahead, give him praise. Thankful. Thankful to be in the United States of America, born in the United States of America. I'm not, you know, I'm not pleased with everything that's going on. I'm not happy about everything that's going on. But I do know there's one thing I can do. I can pray. I can pray about it. And I do know that God hears the cries of the righteous. Amen. And I do know that I've read numbers of times where He'll deliver them out of their troubles and out of their problems and all. And uh, according to the Word of God. And I do know, and I have read, that He is no, Francis mentioned it here Wednesday night, that He said, uh, I've mentioned it a lot of times that God in numbers of places, there's about five different places in the Bible that God is no respecter of person. So if God did it for somebody else, even Israel, He'll do it for you. He'll do it for me. God is a God that can deliver no matter what the circumstances are. So don't forget to pray. And don't forget 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. And, you know, it says, If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn. Listen to this. N- not the White House turn from their wicked ways, but those people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. And he said, And turn from their wicked ways. And if they'll repent, turn from their wicked ways. He said, Then we can hear from heaven, he said, I'll heal their land. How many of y'all believe God can still heal America? God can reveal Himself strong and powerful 
under no matter what the circumstances are. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of politicians may think they're in charge and they're running things. There's a lot of rich folks may think, and to somewhat right now, port, you know, uh, partially, some of them are. They may think they're running things and controlling things, but they're, they're coming into that whenever God steps in. And uh, any time, at any place, God could move by His powerful, miraculous hand. There is not anything, anything too big or too hard for the God that we serve. And uh, I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you that somebody copied this and sent to me because I don't, I'm, please know I'm not, when I, I've cut up a little bit about the, and when I say cut up, sometimes I mean I'm just telling the truth about some of it, some of it not, some of it I'm cutting up. When I talk about Facebook, you know, and all this stuff, I don't, I don't do, I'm not active on it. I, I, other people do things for me, other people send things to me, and some people uh, they'll tell me about something or send me something that was posted on there. And this is, this is one of them that got kind of surfaced back up. I'm, I, I don't know necessarily that this happened at this September the 11th, but it may have. But it, and then again, it, it, I've seen something similar to it, but not exactly, not altogether the information that's in this. That, uh, and most of y'all that know me know that I'm not a, uh, uh, a poem and three points and a conclusion and through with that sermon. Preacher, uh, sometime, uh, I've called it before in the past, uh, a lot of preachers preach sermonettes. They get a little thought here and there. They go online and they look and they get a uh, deal. And uh, I've kind of said it this way over your sermonettes make Christian nets. And I, I, how many of y'all want to be a full blooded 100% child of God and want to hear the Word of God. And many of y'all were here for Sunday school. You got a good solid teaching. I guarantee you did because I know, I know our teachers, okay? Brother Roger taught this morning and uh, uh, Brother Mark teaches sometime. Uh, they rotate. Sister Carolyn in the back teaches. Sister Frances teaches every Wednesday night normally and around here and all of them uh, kind of preach and teach, okay? Kind of woven together. And so, and it's highly and heavily anointed. So, you know, if you want the truth and want to learn more about the Word of God, try to, uh, you know, take advantage of that when you can. And I realize, like, when we changed the time from 6 to 7, and we did that so people would have trouble seeing at night, and older people have to drive a long way, because we have people drive over 30 miles to get to church. Some of y'all that way right now and here to here uh, today. And we, we're, we're honored by that, and we don't take that lightly. And we know that cost. It costs you individually. And then those that do that still give too. They support the church. And they don't take it out of their tithe or offering or whatever. And, and we appreciate that. And God's seeing all that. And He knows that. And, but a lot of people have to work nearly till six. And they can't get off of work and drive a few miles and then get here. I don't even hardly see how Brother Mark uh, comes almost every Wednesday night. And Laurie, of course. And, um, but, but, uh, and lives so far away, lives at Goldonna. And so, uh, but most people have to work close to that time and can't. And a job that he had prior to that, he couldn't. And it was in Cushada, and then he had to go to Goldonna, then he had to get the stuff off of him and get clothes on, and then he just couldn't do it. It'd be, church would be over and be locked up before he could get here. I understand that. So does God. So, but if you, if you want, if you want to learn, you know, more about the Word of God, don't get me wrong, one of, the, one of the best ways is start reading the Bible and ask God to help you, okay? Ask God to help you understand it. And James says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which he said he abradeth, he will not hold it from you, and he'll give a liberal amount if you'll ask God for it. If any man, you know, lacks wisdom or understanding, don't understand. And in my Bible years ago, I put even David Allen. I guarantee you, you know, that I don't understand everything that I read all the time, but the Holy Spirit is certainly able to reveal it to you. Now, listen to this article, and I, I mean, it really... It's really a good one, and it, it sums it up, and it kind of says it. 
uh, exactly. It, it, it's just like for where we're living now. Okay, this is Billy Graham's daughter uh, was interviewed on the early show. Any of y'all see that? And uh, uh, by Jane uh, Clayson, and, and she asked her, said, how could God let something like this happen? Talking about on September the 11th, okay? Uh, the, regarding the attacks on September the 11th of hitting the towers, and most of y'all are aware of that. I think it was 20 year anniversary now this past September the 11th, which is this month. Said, how could God let something like this happen? And then he said, September the 11th, or she said, and hurricanes and earthquakes. And Annie Graham gave an extremely profound and insightful response. She said, I believe God is deeply saddened by this, just as we are. But for years, we've been telling God to get out of our schools, get out of our government, and to get out of our lives. And being the gentleman that he is, I believe he has calmly backed out. How can we expect God to give us his blessing and his protection if we demand him leave us alone? In light of the recent events, terrorist attacks, school shootings, you know, Afghanistan, etc., I think it started, it all started when Madeline Murray O'Hare, how many of y'all remember her? I actually went to here one time. I shouldn't have, but I did. I only took Roger's dad, and did you go to yeah, and Roger? And and it, it it was repulsive to be honest, and it was staged and it was set up. Even with somebody that's supposed to have been a preacher, they're supposed to be bouncing back and forth and interviewing. It was vulgar. It was pitiful, even way back then. Now listen to this. I think it all started when Madeline Murray O'Hare, and by the way, she was murdered. Her body was found recently. When Madeline complained she didn't want prayer in our schools, and we said, okay. Because, you know, you might say, well, I didn't say okay. Well, did you go to the school board? Did you go to the teacher? Did you go to the principals? Did you go, did you get petitions up? You know, I'm going to have to say, I didn't either. I mean, I complained about it, didn't like it. So, in a sense, near about everybody, not everybody, said okay. Then someone said, you better not read the Bible in school. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and love your neighbors, you love yourself. And we said, okay. Then Dr. Benjamin Spock, how many of y'all remember him? I used to use his name. Y'all remember him? Yeah, he was a doctor, supposed to know it all, psychologist, and tell you how to raise your children. Dr. Spock said we shouldn't spank our children when they misbehave because their little personalities would be warped. I never warped your personality. That's my daughter I just looked at. And we might damage their self-esteem. Now, Dr. Spock's grandson committed suicide. And we said an expert should know what he's talking about. And when he said that, we said, okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I've had people over the years who didn't like it when I tell you what the Bible said about raising your children and about rebellion is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod, the rod of correction, to drive it far from. And when I would just use Scripture now, God's Word, uh, I've had them leave the church before over the years. And you say, over the years, what are you talking about? Well, <laughs> it's been over the years, nearly 50 right here in this town. And I've had them leave. I've had them get mad. I've had them send me a dirty letters, you know, and all. And it's defined what God's Word says. How many of you know God's got an answer for everything if we want to find it in His precious Word? Amen? You can find out how to do anything. Best manual in the world. And uh, so now we're asking ourselves, since we said okay to Dr. Spock, I mean, you know, everybody didn't. Some of y'all didn't, so please know this is not for you that did not, that, that didn't go along with all that. But I'm talking about as a whole, you know, with why, why is this happening, what's going on in the world, listen to this. So, now we're asking ourselves why our children have no conscience, why they don't know right from wrong, and why it doesn't bother them to kill strangers or their classmates and themselves. 
probably if we think about it long enough and hard enough, we can figure it out. I think it has a great deal to do with we reap what we sow. Funny how simple it is for people to trash God and then wonder where, why the world's going to hell. Funny how we believe that the new, what the newspaper and the news on television says, but question what the Bible says. Funny how you can send jokes through the email and they will spread like wildfire, but when you start sending messages regarding the Lord, people will think twice about sharing that. Funny how lewd and crude and vulgar and obscene articles pass freely through cyberspace, but public discussion of God is suppressed in the school and the workplace, and now even the government. Are you laughing? Funny how when you forward this message, if you copied this one, and send it to many on your address list, oh, excuse me. Funny how when you forward a message like this, you will not send it to many on your address list because you're not sure what they believe or what they will think of you for sending it. Funny how it, how many of y'all understand that, you know, the Word of God says, if we're ashamed of Him before men, He'll be ashamed of us someday. Do, do you believe that's in the Bible? That's what it said. That's what Jesus said. You know, so I think about that every time when I'm worrying about what somebody's going to think or what they're going to say. Funny how we can be more worried about what other people think of us than what God thinks of it. And then, of course, this person that sent it to me said, pass it on if you think it has merit. And if, if not, then just discard it. No one will know you did. But if you discard this thought process, don't sit back and complain about what bad shape the world is in. God bless you as you share God with friends. No nation or people ever survived or succeeded without Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't you think that's a pretty good article? Yes. Don't you think that's a pretty good response for Billy Graham's daughter to give to the news caster or whatever you would call them? I don't know what you'd want to call them. Uh, if you've got your Bible and, and want to look, I want to read in uh, 2 Timothy. I want to read the third chapter. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. Nearly all of you know this, and when you all get it, go ahead and put it up because we'll roll and we'll have to hurry. But we're going to hurry real fast, and we're going to do our best to to let you go because uh, your NFL game may be on or, or you may be so hungry you can't hardly stand it. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm cutting up with you. Uh, if somebody has to go, we understand that. And we're not trying to deliberately hold you just to be holding you. But I tell you what, I think it's time for us to hear what God has to say. Amen? Uh, and, and, and care about what God has to say and not be so wrapped up sometime with uh, some of the little things. You know, I have a schedule too, and I think you understand that, and most of y'all do, and some of you still have to work, but are y'all ready? Amen. Second Timothy, the third chapter. Second Timothy, the third chapter. I may start reading and y'all catch me, okay? Uh, y'all probably get it there in just a minute. Second Timothy, the third chapter, verse one. And this tells where we're at right now today. I'm going I'm to go ahead and y'all just trust me. They're getting it. Here it is. And we're going to roll with this, okay? So I'll just go ahead and, and uh, look at the screen here. I can see that back here, but I can sure see this just as well, okay? This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, and infinite, I fierce despisers of those that are good, trady, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which crept into house and led captive silly women laden with sin, led away with divers lust. Ever learning 
And I want this to stand out to you now because I'm going to come back. The Holy Spirit really zeroed in on this this morning early. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And let me just ask a question right here. How many of y'all want the truth, the knowledge of the truth? And he said, ever learning, ever learning. And I think of all the educational stuff that's going on now. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, well, let's go on and I'll come back. Now as James and, and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. These people that are always being educated. Oh, there's nothing wrong with education. Please know that. But ever learning. They, they resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, and reprobate concerning the faith. Mm, boy, it's powerful. Go ahead. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine and manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. Persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and not come unto Lystra, and what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivereth me. Aren't you glad we've got a God that can deliver us no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what it is? Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer a little bit. You know, you know, let me stop right here just a minute and say that maybe if you're not being persecuted in certain areas, check your godliness meter. How many of y'all understand what I'm talking about? Check. Some of you don't have a clue. Check and see how righteous you're living. I, I'm talking about not your righteousness, but trying to follow the Lord. Check and see how much you stand up for Him. Check and see how much you're trying to line your life up close as you can, of course, with God's help, to what thus saith God says, what the Word of God says. And, and check and see if you're ashamed to pray out in the public or if you're ashamed to uh, whatever. You know, I, I got guys that help me sometime, and when, before we eat, I pray every time, just about every time. And if it's a situation where I come in as late as on the phone or something, I pray anyway underneath my breath before. Because you know why I do? Because I've read in the Word that if I give God thanks for the food that I'm about to receive, He'll sanctify it. How many of y'all know we're living in a day and age now we need our stuff sanctified? How many of y'all know some of that food you get out somewhere, it, you wouldn't eat there no more if you went in the kitchen and saw how they how some of it happened in the preparation. And Roger said, right, he's in food service. He knows. Let me tell you something. It, it, it's unreal. We, we got told one time, I'm going to tell you something. We got told one time by somebody in a position of authority around even with the state, and they said we have one of the cleanest kitchens, believe it or not, one of the cleanest kitchens and all, and give good report right here uh, above. I better shut up. But how many of you know it's important to give God thanks for what you're about to receive on the inside? Amen? And He'll sanctify and cleanse it because of our word of thanksgiving, by giving Him praise and thanks for it. And, and, and guess what? If God didn't bless you with health and breath and strength and life and bless what you put your hands to, you wouldn't have the money to buy that food in the first place. I've been with people who said, well, I've got to thank God for it. I'm the one bought this. He didn't buy this for me. I want you to know that guy could not even be talking. His lungs wouldn't even work or his heart wouldn't pump if God didn't have his hand on him, if God hadn't created him in his image. So that's why I want to be thankful, why I want to be grateful. I've, I've read too much in the Word of God where he talked about how what God will do for the grateful and the thankful person. Yea, all those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to have some persecution now and then. Come on, you're going to have some aggravation. You're going to have some stuff sometime. But please know, he's not talking about the great tribulation period. There's a lot of difference in being persecuted for righteousness sake than it is to be in the tribulation period when one of these days God's wrath without mixture is going to be poured out on this old world against the Antichrist and the devil from the pits of hell and all of his imps. 
all the demons, God's wrath is going to come against them. You talk about meeting their match. But persecution is not tribulation. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The last couple of Sundays I mentioned about deception so much. That was the biggest thing the Lord warned about was the, for the last day, sign of the last days. He said, take heed that no man, everybody say no man, no man, no man deceive you. That's any, come on, that's any preacher, any pastor, any doctor. I don't care if it's Dr. Fauci. I don't care who it be. I don't care if it's Dr. Sounding Brass or Dr. Doolittle. I don't care, or Dr. Spock. Well, it don't make no difference what his name is. He said, let no man, no politician, don't make no difference what level or what office that politician holds. You know, no preacher, no priest, no pastor, no person, no teacher. Come on. No school, no college. Let no man deceive you. And, 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 and look, I'm, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Isn't it amazing that what's going on today? But continue there, listen to it. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. How many of y'all, just hold it there a minute. How many of y'all have learned some things when you were a child, when you were sitting in a church with mom and dad, when you were sitting in a Sunday school class, when you were in a youth group like Brother Ryan is pastoring here? How many of y'all learned some things when you were a child? And let me tell you something. Sure, you might have learned that, hey, and you might have grown since then. That's great. But I want you to know nothing can take the place of that foundation when they pointed you to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they told you that, hey, if you'll pray, God will help you. You know, they might not have known how to tell you exactly how to get there a whole lot quicker. But I can tell you one thing, that foundation that you've got concerning the Lord, even down to drawing precious promises when you were a kid in a little old box at home, I'm going to tell you something. Anytime you heard the Word of God read, anytime you read it for yourself just a little bit, but anytime you heard the Word preached or the Word taught, let me tell you something, that, that had a, a part of building you a foundation and, 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 and putting something, uh, letting something be instilled in you. And he said, continue the things which thou hast learned and thou hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And how many of you know the Holy Spirit will quicken things to your heart and your mind if you're sincere before God and with God and you want to learn, you want to grow. He will give you. Brother Roger mentions it a lot. Several of you do. I do sometimes. God will give revelation knowledge. And if you'll pray and believe God, He can reveal stuff to you that you've read maybe a hundred times and never saw it and all of a sudden it'll jump out at you. And it's kind of like that part where it said they're ever learning this morning. It's just funny in verse 7, I believe it was. But anyway, it said, continue the things which, and, and, and uh, knowing who you learned them, and the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you and teach you. Listen to this. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. How many of y'all remember uh, Scripture when you were little? Some Scripture? Amen. Amen. Hey, I know we don't have no time here and I shouldn't do this, but just, just one or two or three or four of you, just quote a scripture right quick or part of it. Just quote a scripture that you remember when you were a child you heard. That's it. That's it. Amen. Amen. And everybody, everybody, and a lot of this was about salvation as well, and that's great because we learned that. We need to learn that because we need to be saved. Amen. We need to get in the family of God, and that's great. And that's what uh, everybody knows John 3, 16, don't they? Just about. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you know, hey, these things stick in your heart when you hear that, when you've been taught this as a child. So, you know, hang on to it. And then learn what Luke three sixteen says. Now don't go there. That's talking about he'll give you the Holy Ghost. Okay, okay. If you ask for it, Holy Ghost and fire. So you don't have to go there. You don't have to check me out. It's there. I promise you. But learn, learn the scripture. But the things you've learned when you're little, isn't it amazing that you can run across things? And then, then you know the scripture, Brother Kenny said, "Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord." Well, we know it's not our holiness; it's His. 
But isn't it something at times? I bet if we could ask Brother Kenny. Uh, now, Brother Kenny, and he, and he can't say too much because a lot of his family is here. But I guarantee you if, you, if he ever was going to do anything wrong, that scripture came back to him. And he nodded his head. That scripture, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And he says, this thing I'm fixing to do, is it holy? Is it righteous or not? How many of you know these scriptures will help us that we've been rooted and grounded in if we'll just not forget them and if we'll hold on to them? And he said, from a child you've known this, are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ. We know where our faith's at, amen? And in righteousness, and it's his instruction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, go ahead. I like this, this, this one here, the last. Uh, Go, go ahead and back one up on now one sixteen for all scripture. Okay, the scripture that I use, the scripture, Brother Roger, Brother Mark, and my wife, and Sister Carolyn, and anybody else that's teaching, Brother Marvin, in the Sunday school department, and all of you that help with that on Wednesday night, all that Ellen and Jerry and different ones and Ryan, all everybody, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Guess what, everybody agree with that? It's profitable for doctrine. You believe it? All scripture is profitable for doctrine. Now, what about this next one? It's profitable for reproof. How many of y'all believe all scripture? If you'll let it, it'll reproof you before the preacher even preaches it. Amen. Amen. And for correction, how many of you believe the scripture can correct you? Anybody ever had some correction from the Lord as you've read the word? Mm hmm. For correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now this next one says, even for the preachers and the teachers, uh, that the man of God or the woman of God, the one, you know, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And uh, let me just, let me just say, and again, I, I am going to just seriously, I'm going to leave, uh, I'm not even going to hardly get started good. But let me just back up to verse 7. And it said, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And, uh, and in verse 8 it said, These people resist the truth and they corrupt the minds and they're concerning the faith, it says, they're just reprobates. That's what it said. And, and you know, I thought about we, we've had people, we've had kids that went to college. Now, please know I am not against colleges and institutions, but I'm, I'm against the part whenever the teachers and the professors will try to undermine what has been embedded in them from a child and try to let them know that the things of God or try to tell them that it's not real or that it's just We've got, we, I've got family on both sides, okay? That it's just science that Jesus and God and everything, that's just science, that's all it is. Let me tell you something. It's science, all right. God created all of it. He created everything that they're calling science. And he gave the knowledge to all of it. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that it was worded this way, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. And they got corrupt minds and they're reprobates concerning the faith. They don't even have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that He gave His life for them so they could be saved and so they could be born again. And then the, the word that down in verse 13 it says, the evil men and seducers are going to get worse and worse. We know they are to the coming of the Lord. We're in the middle of it right now. I feel like right now. Well, somebody said it like this. Remember how people used to say the smack dab middle? That meant you're right in the middle of whatever it is you're talking about. And he said, deceiving and being deceived. And that the, the Word of God is for me or anybody else that's preaching or teaching. And it's, it's supposed to help uh, reprove people, rebuke people, and exhort people uh, with all long suffering and doctrine and to correct them uh, in righteousness. And, and you know, but again, when it said they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, isn't it a shame that these, these folks are teaching and learning, going to seminars, getting new material to teach, 
and they're trying to teach it. And of course, concerning the faith, they're reprobate. And just this last week, I don't know, how many of y'all remember that I told you uh, last week, even concerning the educational system now, which again, please know I'm not against education, not against schools, not against college, but I am against this. I am against the folks that don't ever come to the knowledge of truth, okay? And they're ever learning, they're ever teaching, and they're doing all this stuff. And just last week, there was a teacher, and this was on news. And if you didn't see it on the news that you watch, then honey, I'm just going to go to tell you, you're not being informed with the truth if, it's, if you don't see it out there, if you don't know. And I'm not saying this come from one source. This came from several different people reported. And you could probably even Google it and check it out if you wanted to do it that way. I don't know. Some things, though, as soon as they get the truth out there, if they don't like what somebody's saying, if it's, if it's different from their agenda, they scratch it. They take it off. They remove it. And one way around that, if you get an article, something you want to look at, I don't care if it's on YouTube or what, send it to your email for right now. You can do that, and then you can have it, then you can pull it up. And then you could print it out or print it off or look at it or listen to it or whatever. And, and or you could record it or whatever you want to do. There's different ways to hang on to some of it for a little while, but I don't know how long that'll last. But what the point I was telling you, and I mentioned last Sunday, there was a teacher that said, the American flag offends me and I don't like it. In the classroom, in a public school now, it offends me and I don't like it, but I'm going to put the LGB flag up and take the American flag out. That happened last week. Now, how many of y'all saw that or heard about it? Not just heard about it from me telling you, but heard, okay, very few. But there's enough there that, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, okay? So I got way more than two or three witnesses that saw it and heard it too. And so, again, like I said, I'm not fussing at you, but if you're not hearing some things and know what's going on, please don't be like, and please don't think that I'm saying you are, but don't stick your head in the sand and not know what's going on. How are you going to know how to pray? Are you just going to pray, oh Lord, bless me, give me a bigger car, give me a bigger house, give me more money, give me, just pray. Let me tell you something. We need to be praying things a whole lot more important than that. All that other stuff come if we need it. How many of y'all believe that? Yeah. That other stuff comes if you need it. And, and uh, I, one guy said like, if he, if he can get through you, he can get it to you. And that's true. God can get you blessings. If you don't just hang on to those blessings and not share and not give off of those blessings that God blesses you with. But here's another thing that just happened. Happened, I just saw it, Friday. A teacher, and I'm not going to use the word they used because it was too vulgar for me to use in the pulpit. She was teaching her kids now, and they let it go. They didn't do nothing to the teacher, not yet. Now, there's a lot of parents who were riled up about it. But I don't know if they're riled up about it about like they was when they said you can't pray in school, can't take your Bible and all that. They said, they used another word which is horrible, vulgar, and said, screw America. Screw the police. Screw the military. Kids are, are being taught right now, ever learning. Are you following what I'm saying? Ever learning now. But they're learning, some of them are learning junk. They're learning, learning from people that are reprobates concerning the faith. If these people had faith in God, even that teacher or the professor, they wouldn't get up behind the podium and try to pour this into those hearts and lives and brains of our younger people. Now, you know what's going to happen if the Lord tarried? I don't think he will, but you know what's going to happen if the Lord tarried another 20 years? Not a one of them kids, if they've had that pound in their head, not a one of them kids would serve in the military. And how many of you know, the, even the children of Israel needed an army? Come on. They had an army, and they were strong, and God blessed them. And sometimes God would just take a handful. It's almost like some of our special forces. They can take a handful and get more done sometime than a whole, whatever you would want to call them, a company or a, or whatever, okay? And we need people to serve. We need policemen. I called on one this morning to come out here. And they come. I told them to lock my wife up, and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> Get her off my, no, I didn't. 
There was somebody blocking the driveway sitting there and they wouldn't answer me when they would put their head up and they wouldn't look. So I called the police and let the police handle it. And I hung around in case they needed. I, I knew that Young would be here later and I knew that he's got a son that could do something and I know there's other people and I know, I know the sheriff and all, but I just made one call thinking there's a unit here and they would, and finally they did. They finally come out and like they never got them to move, but they did. And uh, so, because I didn't want it to be here blocking the road and uh, I didn't want it to alarm anybody. And another thing, you don't know what was inside that car and what they were up to. But let me tell you something. God said that he put the people that are in authority like this, especially, you can read about it in Romans, the, the, the police and these people and these officers, they're put there not to bother you. If you're a righteous person, you're not going to have to fear them or worry about them if you're doing what's right. But the unrighteous people are the ones that ought to fear. See, I don't ever get stopped by a highway patrol or a sheriff department car when I'm driving down the road if my foot is not too heavy. And if I'll use the cruise control. But when I get to say, and I believe I make it here, I'm going to run 95 up a hill and then slow down. Now, Timothy, if you say anything, bud, you're fired. We just had to take a trip to Oklahoma, and I had one deadline to make. And I prayed, and it worked, whether you think it did or not. But I, I didn't do too bad. But how many of you know, if I would have got caught, I even told him that, for going fudging a little bit, I deserve it. I deserve it. Because there's a sign there that says how fast to drive. How many of y'all like this preaching? You just love it. You just love it. Yeah, I got brother, brother Yonk. Thank you, buddy. I think I didn't see it. There's brother Marvin. There's a few. Okay. You know, sometimes it steps on our toes. But how many of you know that preachers have always been one to stir folks up for reproof, for rebuke, for instruction, for correction? That's what the Word of God, that the man of God be thoroughly furnished unto all these things. And he called them good works even. But let me tell you something. We, we, need, we need to pray because there's corruption. And you know, I wanted to get to the part where the Lord said that in the last days, Thessalonians talked about it, people are going to be deceiving and being deceived by the deceiver. And, and, and they're going to be, they're going to believe a lie, the Bible says. And I'll read it to you, and be damned. That's what he said. You know what? They're not going to make it. And I don't know about you, I want to believe the truth, don't you? Jesus is. We've got it up here. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Let's all stand together right now. I know some of you are so hungry, you can't listen no more. Your ears done cut off. And some of you are worrying about that torn corn to toss. I start to say torn course. Now I'm, I'm cutting up with you. Nothing wrong with light, love and pleasure, just as long as you don't love it more than you love God. Amen? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. If you don't love it more than you love you know, God, and that's great. And I don't think most of you here do. But I, let me just say, and you know what I feel like this morning? I just, and I don't know why, I don't want to embarrass anybody. And we got quite a few young folks here today. Uh, yeah, you can come to the piano. And I'm going to turn everybody loose so in just a second, just, just a few seconds, but not minutes. But if, if you've got some stuff that was embedded in you, that you heard that was, let me just say that was almost like bringing a little bit of confusion and strife, makes it hard for you to understand certain things because what you've heard a teacher or a professor say but you really want the truth. You want the knowledge of the truth. And you want the Holy Spirit to help you. And help you even get over that or get that help block that out of your mind. You know, I, I don't know why I'm saying it exactly like I'm saying it. But if, if, if you covet the prayers of some of the saints, you're a saint too. If you're a child of God, you're a saint. You're a child of God. But if you really would like for the Lord to come down and touch your heart and your mind and help you get some of that stuff. I'm just going to say some of it is trash and you understand what I'm saying. What somebody said they thought or what 
They think about how God works or operates, which is not true. They hadn't studied their concern to faith, they're reprobates. Maybe it's a teacher, maybe it was an instructor, maybe it was a professor. But you want to come this morning and say, God, I want the truth in my head and my heart. I want you to come stand just a minute up around the front. I'll just wait a, wait a minute. I'm not going to try to talk anybody into it. And please know by you coming, it's not going to make me feel any better. You know, don't, so don't do it for me. I feel good for you when you respond. And if the Lord wants you to respond, or if He's moving on you, well then if you respond, God will bless you for it. But it don't, it don't matter to me because I've, you know, I care, but I've just said what God wants me to say, what He told me to say. So it's all for me now. And for the rest of you, if y'all would, please, please pray for me. Because I've never, I've never seen a time in the church now then, the evil forces are worn more than I've ever seen in the past. The enemy sometimes tries to fight me, but guess what? I learned the scripture a long time ago. And he said, greater is he as in me than he as in the world. And I know that. I stand on that. I believe that. I also read, and that's first John, I mean, uh, yeah, first John 4 and 4. I also read that he gives his angels charge over me. And I'm thankful for that. I also read that the guardian angels, the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for the heirs of salvation. And guess what? I'm an heir. And I'm joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Okay? And I tell you what, that key right there is just fine. Let's just sing this. And you can go if you want to go. If somebody wants to pray, you can pray. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family. Oh, so.